Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm gonna be talking about all of my reading for the month of September. It's been a very busy month. I did a lot of reading and I feel like the majority of the books that I read were kind of in that three to four star range. So books that I liked but wasn't a huge fan of. I didn't have a lot of books that I greatly disliked, which is a positive, but I also didn't have a lot of big hits though there definitely were a few. If you're new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that these work is I'll talk about all of my reading stats for the month. I enjoy the stats part of it. It's fun. If you are not interested in the stats, you are welcome to skip forward to where I start actually reviewing the books. Some of the books that I read this month I talked about in greater detail in my mid-month wrap-up. I will link that video up above for you if you want to check it out. And for books that I talked about in that video, today I'm just going to show you the book and the star rating. If you want to hear more detailed thoughts, I'm going to direct you to my mid-month wrap-up. With that said, let's go ahead and get started with my reading stats for September. I told you I read a lot, and if you saw my mid-month wrap-up where I read so many books in the first half of the month, nobody should be surprised, but I read 30 34 things in the month of September. I will say 21 of those were just in the first two weeks, so I did not maintain the same rate, but I still got through a pretty good, reasonable number of things. This is a total of 10,351 pages, and that averages out to 345 pages per day, which is nice to see over the summer when my kids were out of school. My pages per day number definitely dropped down, and we're kind of back up closer to what it typically is for September. This month I only had one DNF for a book I chose not to finish. 17 of the books that I read were either advanced reader copies or books sent to me for review. I did not read any graphic novels. Eight of the books that I read this month were indie or small press. I did not read any translated fiction and I had one reread. As per usual, a good chunk of my reading was audiobooks. This month, 17 of the books that I read I listened to via audio. I also read nine ebooks and eight physical books. So a pretty good spread for the month. 12 of those audiobooks are what I term shelf, which means I had a physical copy on my TBR shelf and I got it off via audio. That is a higher number than usual. And in terms of where the audiobooks are coming from, this month six of them were from Audible, two of them were from my library, three of them were from Libro FM, including some influencer review copies that I get in exchange for mentioning them. I do really love Libro FM, and if you're interested in checking them out, I have a link down below. What's really great about them is that their proceeds go to support local indie bookstores, and you can even select your own local bookstore to have your profit go to. Love that. One audiobook was from NetGalley and five were from Scribd. I've been reading a lot more from Scribd because they increased the speed to three times speed, which is very exciting because before on the app it only went up to two times speed. I have been loving that chain. Moving on, let's talk about age categories. This month I read mostly adult books. 26 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience, six of them were targeted at a YA audience, and two of them were for a middle grade audience. This month I did not read any children's books. In terms of publication date, the earliest published work I read in September was from 1928, and I read a grand total of 15 books that were published prior to 2021. These are what I'm calling backlist. More than usual, actually. I read quite a lot of backlist books this month. Then I had one 2021 release and 18 2022 releases. In terms of author demographics, I did well. My goal every month is to read at least 25% from LGBTQ plus authors and around 50% from Black, Indigenous, or Person of Color authors. And this month I did in fact hit both of those goals. 50% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, and 35.3% were by queer authors. So very pleased with those numbers. Those are things that I value and keeping track of them helps keep me accountable. Next, let's take a look at genre. This was a very heavy fantasy month for me and I'm not complaining. 10 of the books that I read were fantasy, six were romance, and in terms of subgenres, Two of those were contemporary romances and four of them were speculative romances. This is going to be your sci-fi fantasy or paranormal romance. I also read five horror novels, four sci-fi, two literary fiction, two contemporary fiction, two mysteries, and one memoir. So a nice spread of genres this month. Next up, let's take a look at star ratings. As I said earlier, and as you're going to see, I didn't have a lot of books that I disliked, but I had a lot of kind of liked but didn't have strong feelings about or didn't love this month. This month I did not give out any one or one and a half star ratings. Two books got two stars. 
I did not give out any two and a half star ratings. Then four books got three stars, a whopping nine books got three and a half stars, ten books got four stars, three books got four and a half stars, five books got five stars, and one book got six stars. And in my personal rating scale, a six star read is what I give to a favorite of the year. So I had one of those this month. Um, I feel like the last few months it's been about one a month, which has slowed down from earlier in the year. I'm hoping to find more new favorites before the year is over. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> this all works out to a 3.9 average rating for the month, which is not terrible. It's a little on the low side, but I'll, I'll take it. Lastly, let's take a look at my 2022 reading challenges that I set for myself. I actually made some progress this month, which is very exciting. I have currently read six out of the eight classics on my challenge TBR and four out of the eight sci-fi and fantasy books on that TBR. So that leaves me with six books left to read in three months. Can I finish them? We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm tempted maybe later in the year to do a project where I try to complete everything. We'll see. I will say I have been putting off some of the longer <laughs> books on this list. Um, so we're getting down to the wire. We'll see what happens. With that said, let's go ahead and move into talking about all the books that I read in the month of September. This month I had one book that I DNF'd and I talked about it in my mid-month wrap-up. That book was The Makeup Test by Jenny L. Howe. If you want to hear more about that, go check out that video. In September, two books got two stars and one of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That was The Vampire Academy by Rochelle Mead. If you want to hear more, check out that video. And you may have noticed I have been doing individual reviews of all of the episodes of the new Vampire Empire Academy show on Peacock, so that has been fun to do. If you're interested, I can link a playlist of those videos up above. I think by the time this goes up, I should be through episode four, I think. I think is where we'll be. I also gave two stars to The Fae Queen's Captive by Sierra Simone. This was part of a collection of books that I supported a Kickstarter for. So I have the ebooks and I'll be getting the physical books next year. I ordered paperbacks. There are six books in the collection and I started with this one because it sounded good and it just didn't really work for me. I, I think... Honestly, I think Sierra Simone maybe is just really hit and miss for me. Sometimes her stuff just really doesn't work for me as much as I want to like it, and I like her writing in some ways, but this just didn't work. It's an erotic romance novella where a plus-size human woman is the captive of a fey queen, and it is very steamy and gets steamy almost right away, which I think is part of the issue for me. I want a little bit more tension build up between the characters. And also I think I just don't super care for the way she wrote the steamy scenes in this, but to each their own. This is something where I feel like how you respond to this kind of a story is going to be very personal. I do love the fact that she does positive plus size representation. I think that that part is great, but yeah, I just didn't really care about the romance or the characters, and I was I was just kind of bored. Um, and I feel like the world was a little underdeveloped. I don't know. I've seen her do a better job with world building and with atmospheric writing, and I was hoping for more of that. It felt a bit rushed, so not the biggest fan of this one. Hopefully the other books in the collection, as I eventually get to them, will be better. This month four books got three stars, and three of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Consider the Octopus by Nora Rally Baskin and Gay Polisner, Nothing More to Tell by Karen M. McManus, and Night of the Mannequins by Stephen Graham Jones. If you want to hear about any of those, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave three stars to Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. This was on my 2022 Classics Challenge list, so that was why I picked it up. And it was interesting. It was a trip, man. I didn't know a whole lot about this except that it was controversial because it's scandalous and sexy and I was curious. I will say reading the introduction, <laughs> oh, man, I would recommend if you get a chance to do a little bit of reading about D.H. Lawrence and his wife, very interesting material and the introduction to this edition of Lady Chatterley's Lover talks quite a bit about them, their personal relationship and how it relates to the book. It is a trip. Um, yeah, I don't want to get demonetized so I'm not going to go into details but it's it's very interesting. Definitely would recommend 
one thing to know is that this came out in 1926, so it was written in the aftermath of World War I, and there are some really interesting themes in this book about love and tenderness and workers' rights and female autonomy. Like, there's a lot of really interesting stuff. The basic premise of this is there's a woman, Lady Chatterley, whose husband came back from World War I paralyzed from the waist down, and while they have a good mental relationship that he thinks is fine, she needs something more physical, and so has kind of a series of mediocre affairs before falling in love with the groundskeeper. So it's across class lines, it's dealing with some of those dynamics. Now what's really interesting about reading the introduction to this book is that this was the last book Lawrence wrote, and when he wrote it, he was dying of tuberculosis and was impotent because of it. So it's interesting people think he wrote a lot of himself into the disabled husband character and I like I just think that is fascinating in terms of the treatment of that character and some different things that happen in it. His wife had a lot of affairs, did not spare his feelings. I think we see some of his feelings about that show up in this book, but he really believed in tender sex being the thing that would save the world in the wake of a world war. Now, he also had some very specific ideas about masculinity and about male-female relationships that I don't personally think hold up super well. I So I had like mixed feelings about this, but it was an interesting experience. There's also just, oh gosh, again, I don't want to get demonetized, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but if you want to check out my Goodreads review, uh, my Goodreads is always linked down below, and I mention a couple of other things more specifically that are in this book that are very interesting. So um, yeah, liked it but didn't love it. I can understand why it holds an important place in the literary canon. It was very spicy for the time that it came out. Reading it now is interesting. So three stars to Lady Chatterley's Lover. Next up, nine books this month got three and a half stars. That is a lot of them. And five of those I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Yes, five. Okay. Those books are Exodus 2030 by Freydis Moon. And this one I also actually talked about in a reading vlog I did where I wanted to challenge myself to see how many short books I could read in 24 hours. It was quite a lot. I think it ended up being seven that I read, but this was one. So I'll link that vlog up above if you want to check that out where I go into a little more detail. Also three and a half stars and also referenced in that mid-month wrap-up were Lucky Girl by M. Rickert, Office Hours by Katrina Jackson, the Heartbeat of a Million Dreams by Halo Scott, and Zachary Yang and the Dragon Emperor by Sharon J. Zhao. Again, if you want to hear details on any of those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave three and a half stars to A Merry Little Meat Cute by Julie Murphy and Sierra Simone. I was kindly sent a copy of this for review from the publisher, so thank you to Avon for that. This book has a really great premise, and it was fun, but also very wacky and not super believable. I feel like you really have to suspend your disbelief for this one more so than most contemporary romances, I would say. So the premise of this is that a plus-size adult entertainer is accidentally cast as the lead role in a family-friendly Christmas movie, and she's going to be playing opposite her teenage crush, a guy who was formerly in a boy band. So both of them, for different reasons, are supposed to keep things under wraps and are definitely not supposed to be hooking up with anybody. But as it turns out, when he meets her, he's like, oh, I know exactly who you are because he is one of her biggest fans. So things get very steamy very quickly. And of course, it's a little bit silly because there's this whole movie production that they're on where that is not supposed to happen. This is supposed to be super duper family friendly. One thing to note is both of them are chaotic bisexuals. So if you are looking for bisexual representation, I think this is done really well. I love that. So I love the representation. I love the positive fat representation with our heroine in this. I love how sex positive it is. There's a lot to like about it. However, there are so many things that happen in this that I'm like, that would not actually happen. Or like, that is makes no sense. That is not actually how a film production would work. So you really have to suspend your disbelief and it is a little bit wacky, silly, over the top. I'm like, 
obviously someone's going to find out. Like, there's no way. You have a, a, a footprint on the internet. Like, how, why would you think that no one would find out? It's a little bit absurd. But if you just go with it, I think it's a good time. And if you're looking for something fun and festive and sexy, maybe give it a try. I also gave three and a half stars to Green Woad by J. Tulos Hennig. <laughs> Man, okay, so this was sent to me along with the second book in the series by the publisher. They're doing a reprint of it, and it's really, really good, but it's also so dense, and it took me two months to read it, which, you know, like, it's not that long of a book. Normally, I could make it through this, something like this, pretty quickly, but I just could not read a lot of this at a time. So while there's a lot that I love about it, I am going to warn you, it is not quick. It is dense and slow, but also maybe really worth it if it sounds up your alley. This is a queer fantasy retelling of Robin Hood set in medieval Scotland with magic, old gods, pagan magic and rituals. And the setup is that Robin and Marion are brother and sister. Robin is gay and there is a boy who's a stand-in for someone who's shown up in some of the older Robin Hood legends who he develops a thing for. So he is the son of an English nobleman. He's a Christian who's been taught that homosexuality is a sin, and Robin is the heir to, like, a pagan religious thing where he will be inhabited by a pagan god. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there, it, it's star-crossed to say the least, but the detail with which she does the world building is truly incredible. The way she builds out the characters, the emotion, the angst, the longing, the passion, is incredibly well done. I was very invested in the characters, very invested in what was going to happen to them. Sometimes it was hard to read, sometimes it was tragic, and the stakes become incredibly high, but it is it is excellently done. One thing to note is that this book does have quite a number of explicit steamy scenes, so heads up, you may not always be expecting that from a fantasy book. But yeah, this is one where I was so split on it because when it was good, it was so good. But other times I was like, oh my god, it's so dense and so descriptive and I really don't think it needed to be as long as it is. So we landed on three and a half stars, but this is one where I felt a little bit torn about the rating and I am excited to read the second book in the series. I think there are five books in the series, but originally it was a duology, so I'm hoping that reading book two will give me enough of a satisfying conclusion. I don't expect to finish it quickly though if this is any indication. Another thing that's worth noting is if you are somebody looking for indigenous authors to read from, this author is multiracial. She identifies as Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Scots-Irish, which is I think an interesting perspective to be coming at writing this kind of a story from. So lots of content warnings for this in terms of violence, homophobia, like oppression by the church and spiritual abuse. Like there's a lot of stuff in it that is rough at times, but it is also really beautiful. I also gave three and a half stars to Ruination by Anthony Reynolds. This is really interesting. I was sent this for review from Orbit, so thank you to them for the book. The physical book is really quite lovely, honestly, and like the paper is really nice. And also like, I mean like, oh my god, look at that. And it's got artwork under the dust jacket. Um, here's the thing. This is a League of Legends novel. I know nothing about League of Legends at all. <laughs> so I mostly picked this up because I was like, it sounds interesting, the plot sounds interesting, and maybe it'll be good, even if, um, even if I don't know much about League of Legends. And I think it's important to know that because I'm coming at this as a fantasy reviewer, not as a fan of League of Legends as a thing. So I basically think that this is a pretty solid version of an IP novel, something where it's pulling on already owned intellectual property and writing a novel based on it. I think it does a pretty good job of creating a interesting, sometimes fun, accessible story where I think you can get into it, you can understand what's going on, you can follow along with the plot, understand the world and the characters pretty well without needing any prior knowledge. That said, if you are not into League of Legends, I think this is a very middle-of-the-road fantasy novel. It's accessible, 
it's fun, it can be interesting at times, but it, it, like I didn't have a lot of strong feelings about the plot. I didn't have a lot of strong feelings about the characters. They were good. Like it was, it was well executed, but nothing that really stood out to me. That said, I could tell while reading it that this is the kind of thing that if I was into League of Legends and I was already familiar with the world and familiar with the lore and familiar with the characters, it would probably be really exciting and fun to see the characters and places and things that I already have a connection with depicted competently on the page. So I would say if you're familiar with League of Legends and it's something you like, you definitely should give it a go because I think this is a good version of the kind of book that it is. If you are like me and are completely unfamiliar with League of Legends, you could pick it up. I think if you want something that is going to be easy to get through and easy to read, like this doesn't require a lot from you as a reader. In comparison with the book that we're going to talk about next, which is very intense and requires a lot of the reader, this doesn't. Like you can follow it really easily and it's fun. And if you're looking for that kind of a not amazing but fun, easy to read fantasy book, you, you could give this a try. I mean, I say fun some dark stuff happens in it, but it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good time. So three and a half stars. If you're a League of Legends fan, you might really love it. My arms are getting tired from holding up all of these very heavy books, but my final three and a half star read this month, and this is when I also felt a little conflicted about the rating, but I think this is where we're landing, is The Memory of Souls by Jen Lyons. This is book three in the series, and Ah, like, is three and a half high enough? I don't, I don't know. Here's, here's where I land on this. As a whole, this series is incredible. The level of thoughtfulness and detail that went into the world building, the level of complexity to the characters and their relationships and all of the different plot threads that she's somehow managing to pull together is mind-boggling. It's pretty amazing. And there are characters I love, characters that I am rooting for. There's a thruple that I really want to see become a thing. And a lot of interesting political stuff, a lot of interesting questions about the world and the history, really interesting magic. Like, it is so well done as a series. Now this particular book has all of those things, and it has some really great moments and some really great reveals, but as a novel, like a very lengthy novel, as a novel, it is chaotic. It is so chaotic. It needed some structure, at least for me. Not everybody needs that in their books. I would prefer, I would have preferred if this book had a little more structure to it because I felt like I was getting whiplash going from thing to thing, plot line to plot line, character to character. It was all over the place and like so much happened, but also I'm like, what was the plot of this book? Like just a lot of stuff a lot of things happened. And it is the middle book in the series. There are five books in the series. So I think that might be part of it. What's interesting is that I know Angela from Literature Science Alliance. I think this is her favorite book in the series. It was not my favorite book because the reading experience was exhausting. <laughs> I am excited and intrigued to see how how she's going to wrap everything up. I also love the diversity. I love the queer representation. I love the conversations in the whole series happening about gender and gender identity. Like there's just, there's a lot that's great about it. And I feel like as a series, it's going to be a new favorite. But for this particular book, given my reading experience, it was a three and a half star. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I can say about those because this is the third book in a series, but that's how I felt. So we are going to move on to my four star reads. This month I had 10 of them. It's a lot of four star reads and six of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Even Though I Knew the End by C.L. Polk. This was one of those novellas that I read for that 24 hour challenge vlog. Fire by Kristen Kishore. If you are following along in our Graceling read along, the live show for this is going to be October 14th. That's a Friday night over on Mel's channel. I'll have her channel linked down below and it'll be me and her and Kara discussing it. I'm very excited to discuss this. It was real good and real interesting. Into the Riverlands by Nevo. This was also in that 24 hour reading challenge vlog. Nothing But Blackened Teeth by Cassandra Ka, which I think I also read for the 24 hour reading challenge vlog. 
if I'm not mistaken. The two other four star reads I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up were The It Girl by Ruth Ware and Up Against It by Laura J. Mixon. So if you want to hear about any of those many books, go check out that video. I also gave four stars, although I'm kind of rethinking my rating. I'm thinking maybe it should be a three and a half after my discussion with Leanna. I'm, I'm still pondering, but I officially gave four stars to Chainfire by Terry Goodkind, and there is a live show I can link up above on my channel where we talked about this. I maybe gave it four stars partly because it was just so much better than Naked Empire, which was the book before this, but we are well into our year-long read-along for the series, and going strong. I'm just happy that we're back to something that I, I'm not hating the experience of. I also gave four stars to House of Hunger by Alexis Henderson. Oh man, this was good. Also, look how beautiful. I read an e-arc of it before this came, but my pre-order of the finished hardcover came and it's just, it's lovely. So Alexis Henderson wrote The Year of the Witching. This is her second novel and it's really good. It's really interesting. It is queer gothic horror. It's loosely based on the history of the Countess of Bathory, who is a historical figure who was known for bathing in the blood of virgins. This takes a little bit of a different tack, and it is a fantasy world, so there's some magical elements to it, but it is horror. Like, horror. Our main character is a young lesbian woman who has lived in extreme poverty, and she takes a job as a blood maid where her blood will be consumed by wealthy people. There are sapphic relationships. I'm not going to call this romance because it's not. It's a gothic horror, but sapphic relationships, paranoia, body horror. Also, I guess content warning for disordered eating because some of the body horror involves things like that. It's a horror novel. It's like a dark gruesome horror novel, but I really liked it a lot. I will say I think the ending was a little too neat, wrapped up a little too neatly for the length of the book. If it was a novella, the ending would have worked for me. I wanted a little more from the ending, but I think it's definitely worth reading. I also think the subtext of this book in terms of themes is pretty interesting because it's talking a lot about power and class and oppression and the the literal commodification of female bodies, particularly the bodies of poor women and women of color. So very interesting book, definitely worth a read. Then I gave four stars to The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. This is the book club pick for Patreon Book Club, which I'm really excited to discuss as I'm filming this. Discussion is tonight, so once this goes up it'll have happened already. This was so interesting. Ursula K. Le Guin is brilliant, and I can see why her books are pretty much considered modern classics. This in particular is considered a LGBT modern classic because it's playing with this idea of what if there was a society where gender was not a permanent thing, but where people were biologically gender fluid. Uh, now this does run into some issues in terms of still really equating gender to biology, but it's fascinating. And this is one where the the writing quality and the brilliance with which she executes the project she means to execute is five stars. The reading experience <laughs> is less stellar at times, like there are times where it can be a little dry, be a little bit boring, but it's on purpose and it's because she's very committed to this project of writing it less as a novel and more as a set of documents from these particular characters. It's very interesting. If you want to hear more thoughts on this, I do have a pretty lengthy Goodreads review. My Goodreads is linked down below if you want to check that out, but four stars to this. That said, I could see maybe increasing this in the future on a reread, and it is one that I would like to revisit at some point in the future. Very fascinating. My final four star read is a YA horror anthology. This is Man Made Monsters by Andrea L. Rogers. Okay, listen, this is such a good short story collection. Not all of the stories are perfect. I feel like anytime you get a short story collection, some are going to be stronger than others, and that was certainly the case here. But 
the project as a whole is a really cool one and I think is done really well. So this is written by a Cherokee author and this collection of horror short stories is set in chronological order following a Cherokee family over time, which is really interesting. So each short story, you're going to get your traditional horror elements. You're going to get things that range from vampires or werewolves to ghosts and zombies and other things. There's a lot of different kinds of horror that it's playing with. And it begins in the 1800s and goes all the way up to the future, like past, like far future past our, our current timeline, and goes in chronological order. There's a family tree, if you can follow it, at the beginning of the book. And it's so interesting. But what's really smart about it is if you notice the title is Man Made Monsters. And indeed, while there are traditional horror monster horror elements in the stories, often the most horrific thing is human violence, racism, homophobia, uh, oppression, various things. And it's really good. This is so rich and so, so good. <laughs> there are so many important themes that it's unpacking. And while, you know, some of the stories are better than others as a package, as a whole, I think it's really excellent and definitely worth your time. I have this as a review copy from NetGalley and I'm really glad I picked it up. Moving on, let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month there were three of them and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are A Little Hatred by Joe Abercrombie and there is also a podcast episode where me and Liana talk about this in great detail, including spoilers. So if you want to check that out, go follow us on Chapter 3 Podcast, but really liked this one. And the other four and a half star book I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up was Witchful Thinking by Celestine Martin. So check out that video to hear more. I also gave four and a half stars to Signal to Noise by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. This is her debut novel. It is magical realism set in Mexico in two timelines in the late 80s and in 2009. And I really liked it a lot. I love Sylvia Moreno Garcia's writing. This one is interesting because it's more a coming of age story than other things that she's written. She just does unlikable, complicated, messy characters so well, and this definitely epitomizes that. And this was the final book that I wanted to read before doing my reader's guide to Sylvia Moreno Garcia, which is now available. So if you missed that upload and you're wondering what is her deal, why does she write in so many subgenres, where do I start with her, check out that video. It'll give you a primer on all of her books and places you can start. So really glad to have finally gotten caught up with all of her novels. Next up is my five star reads. This month there were five of them and four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. I told you I read a lot in the first half of the month. I was not wrong. I read Galatea by Madeline Miller. This was another one that I talked about in that 24-hour reading challenge vlog. Prime Meridian by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Recitative by Toni Morrison another one I read in the 24-hour challenge vlog. And finally, The Sunbearer Trials by Aidan Thomas. If you want to hear about those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up or check out the related videos. And the final five-star read that I have this month is one that everybody had been talking about, and so I finally was like, okay, I, I need to read this because everyone's talking about it. This is I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. Ooh, it was really good. This is one that I had as an audio influencer copy from Libra FM. So thank you so much to them. And I would recommend the audiobook with this one because Jeanette McCurdy reads it herself. This is a hard hitting memoir by Jeanette McCurdy. I was not familiar with her before this came out and kind of got so much buzz. I was a few years too old to be into iCarly and stuff. She was, I guess, the best friend kind of tomboy sidekick in iCarly. I never saw it, so I wasn't familiar with her, but definitely an interesting title to a book. And there had been so much buzz and I'd heard other people talking about it. I was like, okay, I want to read this. And it is very good, but also a rough read. It documents her experience growing up, being pushed into the entertainment industry by her abusive narcissistic mother and all of the things that she went through. It deals with uh, abuse. It deals with eating disorders addiction, like there's a lot and it is quite graphic, especially with some of the eating disorder stuff. So content warning for that, if you're going to be bothered by it, I, it, it's pretty intense. But I thought it was very good. It was very insightful and kind of sparse in the writing, which I think works pretty well for the story that she's telling. It's horrifying and will probably make you wonder if we should have child actors, to be honest. But um, yeah, really vulnerable, really good. 
I gave it five stars and if you've been thinking of picking it up I would say I think it's worth it. Probably among the best celebrity memoirs that I've ever read. Granted I am not an expert like some people. I haven't read a ton of them but this was one of my favorites of the ones that I've read. Lastly this month I had one book that got six stars for me which is what I give to a favorite of the year and this one is interesting because when I first rated it I gave it five stars but it has continued to really stick with me and I think it deserves that bumped up rating. I was surprised by this though. This is Confessions. Of course I had to change the battery right before talking about the last book. It was Confessions of an Alleged Good Girl by Joya Goffney. Man, this book hit me in a way that I did not expect it to. It made me cry. I made a TikTok about it. And you know what? I think maybe what I'll do is just play that TikTok for you right now. I have a book recommendation for my fellow former and deconstructing evangelicals who grew up in purity culture. I just finished this book and I did not expect it to hit me as hard as it did. This is Confessions of an Alleged Good Girl by Joya Goffney. It is a YA contemporary novel following a teen girl who is the daughter of a pastor who is supposed to be you know, kind of the perfect good girl, but secretly is struggling because her and her boyfriend of two years have been trying repeatedly to get it on and have been unable to do so and they can't figure out why. And he has finally broken up with her. And so she starts looking for answers and in the process figures out that she has this thing called vaginismus, which apparently can be caused sometimes by, um, you know, religious trauma and purity culture. I wish I had this book when I was a lot younger. This had me at the ending trying not to cry in a public place and uh, crying while writing my review on Goodreads for it. But I feel like a lot of people should read this and have this information. As somebody who grew up heavily in purity culture and was an actual, you know, good girl, did things the right way, uh, you know, something less severe than what she went through was similar to my own experience after getting married when we had nobody to talk to we didn't know what we were doing and you know with like limited experience limited you know education on these topics it, it can take a while to figure it out and you know i mean 11 years later we're still unpacking some of our own hang-ups because of purity culture but this book was so good. I wish I had it as a teenager. It is beautifully done. It's also just so hopeful and I think also does a really good job of talking about how her parents were trying to protect her. I can relate. Her mom had had a traumatic history with, uh, you know, getting things on pre-marriage. Again, I I, I can kind of relate. And they didn't intend for her to feel like her value and worth was linked to how pure she was, but that was how it came across. Again, I can relate. And because of that, I did wait for a lot of stuff and I, I kind of regret it. Um, anyway, go check it out. So yeah, that's Confessions of an Alleged Good Girl. I did not expect it to affect me the way that it did. I ended up talking about this book to my therapist in our last session because it brought up a lot of things for me that I didn't know that I needed to process and talk through. I would recommend this to anybody who grew up in evangelical Christianity or in purity culture or anything similar. I think this is very well written as a novel and touches on some really important topics. I'm also just so happy that this exists out there now for teenagers who need some of this information, who need sex positive, sex ed, when they're maybe not getting it other places. It's great. So yeah, this was one where I gave it five stars initially and when I was getting ready to film this I was like, you know what? It deserves it. It was meaningful. It was impactful. It's really stuck with me and so I'm bumping it up to the six star favorite of the year status. So there you go. Those are the 34 things I read in the month of September. It was a lot of stuff. Granted, I read a lot of novellas so a big chunk of it was that but just in general I, I made a lot of good progress. I read some really great things. I read some mediocre things, but you know, overall it, it was a pretty good month. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, 
Tell me about a book that you didn't expect to affect you the way that it did. I think for me Confessions of an Alleged Good Girl, I had heard good things about it from Ashley over at Bookish Realm and that was a lot of why I picked it up. But man, I did not expect it to be as impactful. I, it's not like a re I don't read a lot of YA contemporary fiction, but this one I'm so glad that I did. Let me know about something like that for you in the comments below, a book that you picked up, thought you would like it, but didn't expect it to be as hard hitting as it was. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.